Good evening, everyone. You hear me okay? My name is Drew Dameron, and I'm the library manager here at the Tokyo American Club. And thank you so much for coming out tonight to our tech talk. Writer, columnist, consultant, and coach, Mrs. Karen Hill Anton is our special guest this evening. For more than 15 years, she wrote the popular column Crossing Cultures for the Japan Times. She has done consulting work for major corporations such as Deutsche Bank, JP Morgan, Pfizer, and Shinsei Bank. She served on the Internationalization and Society Advisory Council of Prime Ministers Keizo Obuchi and Ryotaro Hashimoto. She has served on several boards, including institutions like Temple University and the Shizuoka Human Rights Association. She's a devoted student of Hula and has earned a second degree mastery of Japanese calligraphy after studying it for 25 years. She has raised four bilingual, bicultural children and has made her home in rural Japan since 1975. Needless to say, she has been living a fascinating life. Last year, she published her memoir, The View from Breast Pocket Mountain, a treasure trove of previously untold stories about her experiences crossing borders and cultures, creating a life and finding contentment in a far off country. Her book became the gold prize winner for the SBR Book Awards, and it received the Book Readers Appreciation Group medallion in 2021. Now, we will begin tonight's event with Karen's presentation, and then we'll open it up to the floor for questions from those attending in person and virtually. For those online, please use the Q&A function in the corner of your screen to submit your questions, and I'll pass them on to the speaker on your behalf. After the Q&A, we'll have a book sale and a signing over here to close out the event. And those attending virtually may also purchase a book to be signed to pick up at the library later. Please just let us know your name and your tech number, and we'll set them aside for you. They are 1,970 yen. Thank you again for coming out tonight. Please join me in welcoming Karen to our club. Good evening, everyone. I am indeed happy to see all of you here and to have an in-person event. <laughs> I, I really looked forward to the moment this would happen. Since the book has been published, I've done a number of uh, events and book groups and, and talks, but 90 8.9% of them have been online and on Zoom, and I've really had enough. So I very much appreciate this evening. But to begin, I uh, will just tell you that uh, adjusting to life and living in Japan has been a process. I had to adjust, adapt, and ultimately accept the society that I cho I've chosen to live in. And it's been mostly a painless process, but naturally there have been challenges along the way. I had a lot to learn, but I'd like to think that I was able to pay attention and be observant and really get as much as I could out of this culture. And over time, I feel I've not only grown, but changed. When I arrived in Japan, I was already a, a mother. And since that time, we've had three children born here. And I'd like to share my perspective as a mother, living and raising a family in rural Japan. And when I say rural, I, I mean a very small and isolated community. So I'm going to uh, just begin and read an excerpt from the memoir. Uh, those of you who've read the memoir uh, may recall this, this part. In Japan, I felt that a mother is not just a private role within one's family, but a public one as well. There were ways you were expected to behave, speak, and yes, dress. All news to me as my mothering style, reflecting my general lifestyle, could probably have best been described as freewheeling. One of the few times I rebelled against what I saw as insufferable conformity was when I wore a beige dress to our daughter's elementary school graduation. I knew, I'd been told, all of the mothers would wear black. I'm sure it seems like a small thing, but when you see that graduation photo, it's obvious I was announcing loud and clear, I'm a rebel. I not only marched to my own drummer, 
but the last thing I will do is what everyone else is doing just because that's the way it's done. Uh, but that was the early me. I later fell in line, at least to some extent, lest my children pay the price for my showing up at PTA meetings and on open school days, not as their mother, but as the foreign woman who is obviously different. I had to stop with the I'm doing my own thing stance. The first things to go were my dangling earrings. Later, the long skirts I'd bought in India were only worn at home. I remember our daughter telling me that when I go to P PTA meetings, that I should be sure to dress like the other mothers, innocently believing that I'd blend in. I showed up dutifully, but no, made no effort to blend in, just not stand out. And I had to learn that as a mother, there are always duties and no escape, nowhere to run or hide when my card came up. Although it took years for this to sink in, I did come to see that it was impossible to live in a Japanese community and not accept this basic fact, your turn will come. Every time I was told that I'd been selected for yet another committee, my first reaction was, and without fail, no way. But this was followed and with lightning speed by the realization that it was my turn. I wasn't even dreaming of saying, no, I won't do it. I got to know local women, other mothers, through the many community activities we were all active in. These neighborhood women were the same ladies I once got together with for a bonenkai, a year-end party. I've been to many Japanese parties, and the simplest thing I can say is, we don't mean the same thing when we use that noun. But this particular party turned out not to be just a fun get together, but a total blast. Housewives and mothers, one and all, a women only party was a potluck dinner. And it was a delicious, if somewhat mixed bag feast of pizza, fried oysters, salads, baked stuffed fish, and chocolate cake. I was the only one to bring a traditional Japanese dish. <laughs> Oden, simple and hot, and what I'd fed the family before going to the party, this clay pot stew of boiled fish cakes was eaten up immediately. Along with the beer and wine, there was, you guessed it, karaoke. Later, someone put on a tape and all my sister housewives started to dance to a song that had the refrain, Popeye the Sailor Man. I recall the song was popular with our daughter when she was in second grade. Do you have any dance music? Someone asked me. Dance music? I couldn't conceive of a party without dance music. I was home and back in a flash with Hammer, LL Cool J, Salt and Pepper, Tina Turner, Third World, Marvin Gaye, Prince. I put on the cassette and within minutes, the fluorescent lights were turned off and someone plugged in a thing that looked like a crystal ball with garish lights in it that rotated at a dizzying speed. One woman stood on a chair twirling a flashlight while calling out, let's disco. With a lot of loud laughing and talking, it got positively boisterous. There was sweating, taking off of sweaters, and general letting down of hair. And while they could, there was not a man in sight. We could never act like this if our husbands were around, my neighbor said. If they were here, they just wouldn't like it, and we'd never feel so relaxed. And even if our husbands pretended to enjoy it, you can be sure they would complain about it the next day. Anyway, we wouldn't be comfortable acting like this around them. Considering the degree to which they were letting it all hang out, I asked her if they didn't feel pent up all year long. After all, year-end party means just that. Oh, no, no, no. Our husbands expect us to be meek, quiet, and well-behaved, and we're used to it. It's no problem. I couldn't have been more different from these women. 
what they could accept in their marriages, I would have found not just stifling, but unbearable. Yes, we were very different. But here we were, women on the loose, escaping mothers, housewives gone to hell, partying our butts off. Like I said, it was a total blast. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to do something of a visual presentation of uh, my memoir and uh, my, my story, uh, at least to some extent. I, I, yeah, most of these uh, photos I will now sh show you are not in the memoir, but you, you'll see uh, so, some new ones. And I'll first have to apologize for the quality of some of these photos. Many are very old and before digital uh, photography. But I'll ask you to bear with me because they, they really are precious family photos and I'd like to share them with you. Oh, <laughs> that's my husband, Billy and, and me, um, obviously a number of years ago. Uh, as some of you know who have read the memoir, we're old friends. Uh, we've known um, each other since we were teenagers growing up in New York City. And so, I mean, like a hundred years ago. And th this is one of my f favorite um, photographs because I call it the adoring husband. And this was uh, about um, the time in 1974 when Billy was invited to study in Japan. And he asked if, if I would come with him and I basically said, sure. Now, of course, if he were to ask, I would say, um, what about health care? <laughs> <You know? laughs> what about our retirement? You know, where will our children be educated? But then I, I was uh, up for it or down for it, depending on uh, where uh, in the city <laughs> you come from. But uh, we, we uh, decided to go, but instead of coming directly to Japan, we did, decided we would go overland. And we first went to Europe and toured a good part of Western Europe in a Volkswagen Bug. We went to Belgium, Holland, England, Wales, Scotland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, France, Italy, and then drove border to border across the former Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Turkey, Iran, and Afghanistan. We sold out a car in Kabul and then took public transportation through Pakistan, India, Nepal, and Thailand. We were on the road for you know, one year. Uh, and, and I should uh, not neglect to mention we had our five-year-old daughter with us. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it was, but it wasn't a big thing. If it were, I wouldn't have done it. So, anyway, for that entire trip, we didn't have a camera, and this um, one uh, picture was taken in Thailand when we um, took a trek to northern Thailand, and we had as a traveling companion for a while a an Australian man, and and he said he would send uh, photographs, um, send um, some prints when he returned to his home in Queensland. And this photo shows us visiting the Aka Hill tribe. And I wish I could tell you um, how I felt when we visited the last tribe that was called the Karen Hill tribe. I, if there were any way to explain to these people <laughs> you know, that connection, I believe me, I, I would have, but, but there absolutely wasn't. In any case, a after uh, our, our uh, journey uh, uh, across um, the East, we arrived in Japan on June 1st, 1975, and we went first to a dojo, a training center, where this is where my husband uh, had been invited. And he, he was studying martial arts and yoga and traditional healing methods. 
we were there for for one year, and I, I write uh, about the experience in, in some detail in, in the memoir because the master or, or sensei was something of a tyrant, to, to say the, the very least. Um, he was a charismatic figure, but um, he was all controlling, and I couldn't wait uh, until we left. And, and we did leave when Billy's one year was up. And this is where we went. That's Futokoroyama, which can translate as Breast Pocket Mountain, and it's from this name that I gave the title of my book. Now, sometimes when I tell people, oh, I lived in an isolated farmhouse in a remote place, they don't really get it. <laughs> but I think when you see this um, photo, you, you can see it was in, indeed uh, very, very isolated and, and sometimes a, a lonely experience, which I also write about in, in the memoir. It was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Um, well, I, I lived there. I can't say that I complained even about the fact that we didn't have hot running water. We didn't have a flush toilet. We didn't have a heating system. But we, we were young and stupid <laughs> and thinking, you know, oh, this is, this is, uh, this is the real Japan. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, we didn't know about life in Tokyo. That's <laughs> all I can tell you. <laughs> oh, oh, I went backwards, sorry. This is also a, a very early photograph, um, and that shows us sitting on the Engawa of our farmhouse at, at Futokoroyama. And the little girl in the picture is the same little girl that is on the cover of the book of my memoir. And that's her back there. Raise your hand. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. And, it, and as you can see, uh, there's Bill dressed in a suit and tie, and I assure you that's not how he <laughs> dressed at home with Daly. He was probably on his way to his um, job, his position as a professor at a university in Hamamatsu. Naturally, naturally uh, living in the Japanese countryside, I adopted many of the, the ways of my, my neighbors, um, all of whom were farmers. And this is how Japanese women typically carried their children, naombu. And so I, I quickly learned uh, this is convenient, it, it is practical. I could put Mia on my back and she could nap while I attended to farmhouse chores, of which uh, seemed like there, there was never any end to them as far as I, I, I could see. And as you can see, her feet are hanging below this blanket, so she was already quite big. But uh, this is how I carried her. Oh my goodness, this thing is. This photo shows um, my, my children, Mia, and our eldest daughter, Nanao, at a summer festival with other children in, in our village. And the woman uh, who is standing there, I describe her in the memoir as something of a busybody, though I don't name her. But here I can tell you that, that was Otani san And she would often ask me, and I mean, uh, quite a few times, how tall I was. And I told her, I'm 170 centimeters. And I told her many times, but she would all still ask. And I realized that I was probably the tallest person she knew. And something else she would often ask is, what did my family eat for breakfast? And I think it's because she couldn't imagine that there could be any other breakfast then rice, miso soup, real fish, and, and pickles. And I said, yeah, um, I actually, I make that too. And it was actually the, the breakfast my children preferred. But I also make oatmeal. And I can tell you that took some explanation. And I still don't think she got it, uh, what oatmeal was. 
I'd like to mention too that her son, who was called Yoshibo, it was kind of a nickname, who is about uh, the same age as Bill and me, and he'd love to come over to our house and sit around the, the kotatsu and just hang out. And at New Year's, I uh, once I served him ozoni, which is uh, the New Year's uh, dish, a tradi traditional dish, and he told me that he liked my ozoni better than his mother's. Of course, I, I never told her that. <laughs> now, this photo is really the oldest one in, in this um, whole uh, presentation and the most out of focus, worn out. But I can tell you, uh, it, for me, it's precious. I, I don't even I don't know who took the, the photo or how I got, got a print of it. But this occasion was uh, our daughter Mia's kindergarten recital. And I knew all of the, the other children, her classmates would have their grandparents there, uh, definitely all of the grandmothers. And um, I asked these uh, uh, three women, uh, I invited them to uh, attend the recital, thinking that they actually might enjoy seeing, you know, four and five year olds jumping around on stage. And they came and, and they did. And as you can see, they're all dressed in kimono, which is what, you know, women of their era, and I, I think they're of the Taisho and early Showa era, this is you know, how they were dressed for anything that would be called an occasion. So they came with me and I, I truly felt that I had their support. And it, it, it was, um, yeah, it, it was meaningful for me. Um, the woman on the far left is Oisan in the middle, Arai-san, and on the, uh, standing next to me, Otani-san, the, the, the woman that I said who's a busy bunny. Uh, they've all passed uh, away now, and um, what can I say? I, I, I remember them really fondly, and especially for their generosity. They really kept me stocked with daikon and green tea, shiitake, mikan. These were things I, I almost never bought because of that. Oh, and I, I should mention uh, Oisan, the woman on the, on the far left, she worked in the fields pretty much up to the end, and she was over 100 years old when, when she, she died. Yeah, it's so cute. <laughs> He's now this tall, of course. <laughs> That's our son, Mario. And I don't put um, this photo there, the show a cute baby, but I want to point out the lantern in the background. Now, I was visiting our friend, uh, Kuniko Ono, and she had these, uh, this lantern displayed, and I, I just admired it. I just thought it was very, very nice. And she said, oh, Karen, you know, I, I have several. I'll give you one. I was thrilled, you know, to, to have you know, such a beautiful thing. And I set it up in our living room. And it wasn't until years later that I realized that this lantern was a symbol of death that I had set up in our living room for years. <laughs> and I can just, uh, I mean, I really had to laugh at myself because uh, um, it was just one of many cultural faux pas. This is Dr. Mizumoto, and I write about him lovingly and respectfully in, in my memoir because he really was such a, a wonderful doctor, and he's the doctor who delivered Mario and also my youngest daughter, Lila. And I, I say in the memoir that his clinic, uh, maternity clinic, had really defined the connection between hospital and hospitality. It was a wonderful experience uh, being at, at the uh, maternity clinic. Maybe that's why I showed up again <laughs> to, to have a fourth child. And no, that's not true, of course. <laughs> in any uh, case, he was my doctor for many years, and now his daughter and son-in-law are my doctors. With a growing family, uh, I 
needed help. Um, this is uh, about the time I started writing a regular column for Trinity Shimbun and for the, J the Japan Times. And I was grateful to have help. Uh, and the woman you see here is Kyoko Izuka. And she, when she um, knew I wanted to, uh, to move to town, she said, that she would help me as a part-time job if I did it. And it made it possible, one, for me to, to move, but also to be able to do and, and accomplish the things um, that I was doing. I, I can't imagine how I would have met my deadlines or anything with, without her help. She was uh, our nanny and housekeeper, and she's uh, our friend until this day. Yeah, and, and also uh, she said she would stay, uh, she would come three mornings a week while Leela, the youngest, our youngest daughter in the pink dress there, uh, until she entered nursery school, and, and that's what she did. After seven years in the countryside at Futokoroyama, Breast Falcon Mountain, I decided I'd had enough. I didn't think it was too much to ask for hot running water. Flush, and a flushing toilet. <laughs> but I really had had enough of, of the isolation and the, the general inconvenience of living in, in the countryside. And I, I told Billy, you know, it's time to move. And he was, was on board with it. And he found this house in the city of Hamamatsu. This uh, was a 10 room house. And it was, you know, um, I would say, you know, something of a relic, really, in, in terms of its, well, the, the design, the, the craftsmanship, and it had a formal garden that um, covered it on all sides. And even though this house was in the middle of a neighborhood, residential neighborhood, and in the middle of the city, that once behind our gate, you couldn't see another house. going backwards again. This just shows part of the formal garden, and this is what I could see from my study. And well, for those who have read the memoir will remember that I said that um, it was known that the mother of, I used to say the former emperor, but um, she, well, Empress Teime, who is the great grandmother of the current emperor, Naruhito, She'd spent a night in this house. So it was, it, it came with its own built in legend. This was my study in, in, in the house. And if you'll notice those uh, screens, they're called Yoshizu Body, and they're made from bamboo um, completely. And I found them in. Uh, that they'd been um, in a storage space. And I thought, you know, I'd, I'd like to use them. They're, they're used in summer because it, they allow breezes to pass. And of course, these old houses didn't have air conditioning. And the owner of the house told me, oh, you know, it's just too troublesome, you know, to take them out. And I said, you know, I, I was willing uh, to do it. And, and she said, well, then uh, of course, fine. And when I removed them, I found that they were wrapped in newspaper from before World War II. And the newspaper was dated from the 1930s. And I, I actually kept some of the paper just because it was like, you know, what just uh, gets thrown away. That's Mario again. I started to study calligraphy, I guess it was about 1980, when I was in, introduced to Oki Ropo Sensei. He was known as one of the five fingers of Japan, and I can assure you that that was daunting just to hear something like that. But he accepted me as his student, and I practice diligently, and you can see even with uh, a baby just a few months old, I'd put him on the zabuton, and as, as long as he'd be quiet, uh, I would practice. 
I write about how Oki Ropo uh, Sensei never talked, is what I, I say. Uh, of course, it, he would sometimes mumble something, but he never gave instruction. And this was almost a shocking experience for me. It was definitely very frustrating because I was used, you know, uh, of course, to when you learn something, you know, a teacher tells you do this, do that, don't do this, don't do, th do that. But he, he never did. And when I would go to his class, we would just watch him write. I, I would sit with the other students and we were expected to observe and then endeavor. That was the, the teaching. After he passed away, I began to study with a, another calligraphy teacher in our area, in, in our neighborhood. And she encouraged me to get a rating. And in this photo, I'm practicing for the EQ, which is the, the level that you would reach before reaching Shodan, which I guess uh, sort of translates as a, like a black belt or uh, first level mastery. And I, I did, and eventually I became a Nidan, second level mastery. Here just shows uh, uh, me, my practice for one of my teacher's exhibitions. Now, I probably did 60 or 70 of these. And she would choose one, absolutely one. And I could never show her at any uh, time more than one or two, because it was, uh, as, as a senior student, it would be considered almost impolite to show um, your teacher work that might you know, not be up to snuff or, or expect her to, to choose um, among work that, you know, that might be poor writing. This is work I did uh, later, and, and this is act, uh, after receiving um, my second level uh, mastery in the New Dawn. Um, the piece on the left is the Ran Tejo, which is probably one of the most famous pieces in all calligraphy. And this is just a fragment. It's, it's a, uh, about 50 characters. And I can tell you, it's, it's a very intense uh, experience writing this, because if you get one character wrong, you have to start again. If one character is not written well, then the whole piece is, is um, yeah, not, not considered uh, worthy. This entire piece is probably more than 300 characters, where I, and I've not written the entire. And, and the, the one on the left is a piece I did for my uh, teacher's exhibition. And just by chance, it turns out that calligrapher is the son of the other one, I, I, which I didn't know. This is just some practice, uh, not practice, but um, our daughter, who is a textile designer and confectioner, uh, asked me to make these, um, this wrapping paper at the time of the Tohoku uh, disaster she and her business part partner made uh, these handcrafted ch chocolates uh, to raise funds for disaster relief. That's just some miscellaneous um, calligraphy. The one in the middle is the Enmei Juku, which is uh, a Buddhist sutra. And here I am practicing for um, a, a large piece. There I am, satisfied. <laughs> Sitting back. Now, since I read uh, that piece from the the memoir, I have to tell you that the three ladies you see with me on the left were at that party I told you about. <laughs> that was a total blast. They were there. I don't know which one was standing on the chair flash, with the flashlight, but they were all there. And um, the, we. We were all members of the Kodomokai, the, the Children's Association, but this photograph was actually taken at an open school day. And the other photo is um, my Martin, uh, some of the members of the Martin dance class that I, I taught for a number of years, more than 10 years. Now, people very um, often ask me, 
What is it like to live in the Yunaka, to live in, in a, um, a community where um, no one looks like me? And I can tell you, no one ever does. Where I live, I don't bump into anybody <laughs> at the supermarket or at the post office or in the doctor's office or anywhere, you know, that, that looks like me. And what can I, I, I tell you? I'm, I'm used to it. And if, if I weren't, I'd be insane. I also like to point out, yeah, it's obvious that I, I look different. I have darker skin. But does everyone notice I'm taller than everyone else either, too? I have longer legs, I have longer arms. This is uh, me with my uh, calligraphy class. And the, the second uh, calligraphy teacher I, I had uh, is sitting in the middle there. And the readers of the memoir will, will know um, John Denver visited us at, at, at our home at Breast Pocket Mountain. And here he is uh, holding our uh, son, Mario, who is then just a few months old. And John absolutely loved um, our area of Shizuoka. And I, I, he, besides for his, his music and, and singing, he was quite well known for his, his love of, of nature. And he took a lot of photographs while he was with us, and he said he would send one once he or would send some once he returned home. And this is one of his um, photographs. This is the river below uh, Futokoroyama, first pocket mountain. This is where we live now, and I don't I don't want to. Try with this. I wonder with the laser if I could point to where our house is. There. This is what's known as a Jutaku Danchi or um, a Danchi of the residential area of single family homes. And, and I understand in Tokyo, Danchi means something completely di different, but um, this is where, where we live now. And Futokuroyama or Breast Pocket Mountain is, if you go up the road here, another drive, another 25 minutes, you, you would be there. So we're, we're actually not that far from, from where we um, used to live. Sorry. Th this is our ho home now. Uh, it's not a farmhouse. It's a custom built house that uh, we built in 1990. This is uh, the living room. And as you can see, I prominently display my calligraphy. But, uh, our house uh, actually was designed by a good friend, um, a German woman and an architect who lived in Japan for many years. And so we had, I would say, um, similar sensibilities about design. This is the opposite side of that same room. And that um, textile is the work of Yamauchi Takeshi, who is a deshi or a follower of Ke Serizawa Keisuke, who is one of the, uh, besides for being a renowned textile designer, but was one of the main um, members of the Minge folk arts crafts movement. I'll just tell you a little story. Um, I saw this, uh, this textile, this piece um, in a gallery on the last day of the exhibition. And I admired it, I just thought it was so beautiful. And yeah, but I had no intention of, uh, of buying it. I, I couldn't afford it. But the, the owner of the gallery came over, he took it down, folded it up and, and gave it to me. And he said, you know, because you, you, you like it uh, so much, you, you should have it. And I said, no, no, no. I said, but, you know, um, you know, I, I, I can't I can't buy it. I, you know, I, I can't can't afford to pay for it. And he said, well, you, you, you'll pay for it when, when you can. I said, but I don't know when I'll be able to pay, pay for it. And he said, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. He said, yeah, you, you should have it. 
I insisted he, he take my meishi, but and he he said you know that that wasn't even necessary. But I just uh, it's um, the, because this is uh, in the same place in our home. It's been there uh, for over thirty years. It's always a reminder to me of that kind of trust, that that kind of yeah, um, I would say you know, in interaction, so it's, uh, almost a relationship built, you know, just um, over something that's that's shared and, and appreciated. Those are my four children. Okay, thank you. I, I, I like hearing the murmuring. <laughs> From the left is our youngest daughter, Lila, and next to her, our son, Mario. And in the middle, Manau, and not the middle, since there are four of them, that's not possible, in the striped dress. And on, on the far, no, okay, that would write, that would be me and the one who, who is here this evening. And they are clearly all, all adults now uh, with families of, of their own and following their lives and, and, and dreams. Uh, with the exception of Nanao uh, wearing the striped dress, they're all, all born in Japan. And this final photograph is our daughter Leela's wedding to Chris. And this is in North Carolina. And I hope I'd like to just point out, um, you'll see Izuka-san, Kyoko Izuka, who is the same woman who I said uh, was Leela's nanny. And she came to the United States to be at her wedding. And of course, we we're all thrilled. And I'll get, I will also point out, um, for the, those who have read um, the memoir, she's standing next to um, three of my nephews, who, uh, you know, my late sister's um, sons. And this is the Anton clan. And as you can see, we are multitudes. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. So we're going to open it up for Q and A. If anyone has any questions, feel free to come up and ask anyone on virtual. You can type your question in, and I'll ask on your behalf. Thank you. Uh, this is Haruna Kiyama. Thank you very much for such a wonderful story. I really enjoyed it. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm the only Japanese tonight. <laughs> this meeting, maybe. I don't think so. Really? Oh, thank you. Well, 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 well. And I really appreciate you for you, both of you, to, to choose Japan to leave. And but I'm afraid because in, in Jap Japanese in Japan is uh, surrounded by sea, and then a long time we cross our country, and we are not accustomed to live with the foreigner. Mm -hmm. So I I just I really. Happy, you just have a wonderful, nice, good experience in Japan. But, but however, I think you would have some bad memory, something, some, our rude attitude to you. So, uh, if you could talk about the kind of part, I would really appreciate as a Japanese. As you have sure. to be careful. <laughs> oh. Right. You know, um, it would be highly unusual if I've lived here for 46 years or anywhere and never had a, a bad experience. I mean, uh, this is not paradise uh, and, and no place is. But I can tell you and very uh, honestly that those things are so insignificant to me that there's, I feel there's nothing for me to dwell on, nothing for me to highlight, nothing for, for me uh, to, to emphasize. And I feel it would be all, yeah, not, not petty, but why would I focus on that when I've met so many good people, kind people, generous people, nice people, welcoming people, hospitable people? I, I mean, what, what can I say? That, that's what 
I would say, feeds me, forms me, makes me who I am. Other people or, or you know, uh, situations that have been, yeah, difficult and not, uh, of course, uh, just in Japan. I, 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 well, it, it's also it's my personality. I, I, I tend not to, to dwell on these things. And, and if anything, I have a, a way of forgetting things that, are, you know, were bad experiences. But, um, yeah, I, what can I say? I, I don't have anything really bad about to say about Japan. I'll just tell this one little story, and I, and I think it's in the book, but our daughter Mia uh, came home from school one day and, and said a, a boy had called her American. And I said, well, guess what, my little friend, you, you are American, you know, and that, that, that's, that's not an insult, you know, but of course, as a young, as a child, you, you know, all children want to fit in and no one wants to stand out or, or seem, you know, appear to be, be different. But yeah, you know, you know, things ha have happened, but um, yeah, I, I don't have any horror stories to report. I really don't. Good. One question virtual here. Okay, sure. What would you tell a young Karen? Would you do anything differently? Young Karen? Oh, young Karen. <laughs> She's still young. No, um, yeah, not so much. And it's not, okay, I don't want it to, to appear like, you know, I haven't made any missteps in my life or whatever, but I'm very satisfied w with my life and the trajectory it has that um, I met my uh, wonderful husband many, many years ago. He had the good sense to marry me, though he, he turned me down originally. <laughs> and that uh, we have four um, wonderful children. I don't know that I, I would tell myself um, something. Maybe uh, uh, to learn languages early. Uh, pr probably that would be um, the one thing I, I would say, yeah. Thank you, and we've got time for one more question. Please. Only one more? Oh, no. Oh, okay, no, sure. Karen, Catherine here. Thank yeah, you so Karen. much. I was so pleased to meet you at Kinokuniya last Saturday after uh, many times seeing you online. So you've written your memoir. I wondered if any of your children have been inspired by you to write their own memoir of their time in Japan. And maybe your daughter can speak, but I was really fascinated to yeah. know if that is something that's happening for them as well. Oh, well, <laughs> look, did you, you didn't see her do it again? That's <laughs> no. a no from one daughter. Yeah, How about yeah, yeah. your other three? Yeah, I don't think so. Not, not, not yet anyway. They're, they're, I mean, they're still so young, you know. I mean, Britney Spears may have written her memoir when she was 21 or something, but I, I don't really think they're ready to do that. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And please join me. Thank you. Me.